Candace Crawl Goldman has been helping others awaken since the year 2000 when she became a Reiki master. Since 2008, she's also been practicing Dolores Cannon's method of QHHT while founding and managing the original Dolores Cannon Worldwide Professional Support Forum for practitioners of her method. She was blessed to have more than three years of experience personally assisting the late Dolores Cannon in teaching and mentoring others in her live classes and advanced programs. Candace also offers coaching and consulting services remotely and in person and is a self-help and spiritual public speaker. She also hosts two radio programs. The first is New Earth Journey and that's her bi-weekly Tuesday show on BBS Internet Radio. And Fridays finds her hosting N5D Radio's weekly program called Quantum Healing with Candace. Now Candace has also uh, donated one of her QHHT sessions, as I mentioned before, with the raffle, so be sure that you get your raffle tickets for only a dollar for a chance to uh, win one of the four prizes for a, QH, a free QHHT healing session. You'll have to go to Kansas for that, or she'll do a, um, she'll do a um, life coach, a spiritual mentoring coaching session on, uh, on the phone. So uh, welcome Candace Crawl Goldman. posted this on my Facebook page. Her name was Jill, and I actually, her name was Jill, sorry, her name was Jill, and I actually knew her uh, not too far from here, back in the early 1980s in Miami. Wasn't there for very long. And I hadn't talked to Jill literally in three decades. And she posted this, and it really struck me because I knew this conference was coming up. And I thought, you know, what am I gonna talk about? How am I gonna talk about it? And I told her, you just don't know how amazing it is that you posted this to my Facebook page. It's very appropriate. And then she said something even more amazing to me. She said, just so you know, you've always been that way. And I thought, wow. I mean, I was just 23. You know, I was still, you know, drinking martinis at the bar. And, but I was making a lot of noise back then, even sometimes about things I didn't know about, I guess. But I've been back to look at this image many times since then, um, asking myself, why did those remarks stick with me so much? You know, why, why is this so amazing? Well, first off, that little girl kind of looks like me, or at least what I used to look like. She's prettier, but, but I kind of looked like that when I was a kid. And I think uh, the reason it's so important is something about being a kid is part of what this superpower thing is all about. And I remember to keep talking about this. So. so it has something to do with being a child, right? When I was a kid in the 1960s, we played outside for the most part. And when the boys would let me, because I lived in a neighborhood of almost all boys, we would play, you know, superpower games, right? Superhero games, Batman, Robin, Superman, right? We'd get a beach towel, you know, and we'd do all that. And um, often we would create our own superpowers. How about you? Did anybody play like that when you were a kid? Yeah, right? And our conversations were fresh and accessible, and our playtime was so important and relevant to our lives. And maybe you remember what it was like to be so immersed in these play games that it seemed to you that you could almost manifest these ideas. I mean, really manifest them, right? They weren't just pretend, right? So I remember being a little girl on a swing and with that towel around my, my neck, and no, that's not me, but that, that could have been me. <laughs> feeling so close to feeling my body actually lift off. Do you remember swinging? How high can I swing? How can I get there? Can I lift off? Can I fly? 
it seemed so possible because in part, it seemed like I could remember there was a time when I really did fly. Right? Am I, not, am I the only one who felt that way? You, rem you remember this. This is why it's so exciting. So flying was just so important when we were kids, right? We're going to do it no matter what. We are going to fly, right? All of the superpowers seemed somehow accessible when I was a kid. All the other superpowers, x-ray vision, psychic powers, you know, invisibility, right? I'm invisible. Healing, teleporting, right? Time travel, simultaneous existence, all of those, immortality, right? And how empowering it was to be a kid and to be this super powerful. It energized us. And we believed somehow, somewhere, anything and everything was possible. We trusted and believed fully in our imagination. That's why, when we were little, the mind of a kid, we thought magic was real. So is it real or is it not? So there's this insidious programming we do in our culture. We started at a very early age, and it's not on purpose, it's just repeating. You know, we're repeating and repeating what our ancestors have repeated to us, carefully installing the idea and the belief system that magic is not, never can be real. And that brings me to magicians. Magicians were creepy to me, just like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow for me anyway, they were completely different than superheroes. Their powers weren't singular, they weren't obvious, they were supposed to be mysterious, but to me they just seemed like they were deceitful and underhanded, and I didn't like them. And I never liked them. And for a very long time, until very recently, I didn't quite get why I didn't like them. The other kids liked them, parties, TV, things like that. They were entertaining, they put on good shows. I don't know, they made my skin crawl. You know, back when, when the illusionists were on TV and people made such a big deal, I like wanted to leave the room. I didn't want to have anything to do with any of that. They made me easy, uneasy and angry. Why in the heck would they make me angry? Well, I know exactly why now. So even as a kid, at gut level, I understood something profound about the human condition and consensus reality. So superheroes, you know, we, we played them out on recess <coughs> and playground and outside time. But really, they were just lines on a piece of paper in a comic book or on a screen. And magicians made a career showcasing their deception. So a standard magic show to me was something like this. Um, it perpetuated a profound agreement that we had, like, like this idea. Magic's very real, but we, you, are not allowed to access it or use it to your benefit because that's our group agreement and our group belief. But today, we're going to let this guy here pretend that magic is real. Somebody else, not you. And they're going to do these things, right? Right here during this show. So the superheroes were a little more like a template for frolicking outside, but these guys upset me. They just seemed mean. They stood up there and did something called magic, and we weren't allowed to do it. So we're pretending that magic's not real. It can only ever be pretend. I didn't like that. No wonder it pissed me off. They were just another crumb kind of to toss to us, right? Like recess or the movie day at school or the once a year field trip, those kinds of things just to keep our imagination and our creativity alive just a little bit. So we've been programmed to believe it's not real. We really didn't know. So to me, it seemed like it was very real. Didn't it seem like to you that if you just read the right book or something, magic could be real? And almost everybody I have asked this question has said, yeah, as a kid, it just seemed like you just could be real somehow, some way, if you, if you found the right black magic book at the back of the magazine, right? Great. But we grew up to be programmed to something different. We went to school, we're programmed, not believe in magic and superpowers anymore, and we eventually learn about the real world, the adult world, and we start accepting those belief agreements. 
you know, Cape will have us fly, no swing will take us high enough to launch us into flight. There's no teleporting, no time travel, no healing. Immortality was just for, you know, some Greek gods and some dusty old folks. So we've been taught and programmed to conform, to fit in, keep our heads down, stay in our cubicles, don't make a fuss, be fearful of our great power and even greater potential. So we begin to learn our parameters. We begin to be taught to color within the lines, learn what is expected, keep our heads down, and mostly be quiet. And I wasn't very quiet as a kid. I think maybe that's what Jill meant. And I actually did like a little bit of school, the reading part of the story. But then we were set free, right? Recess, remember bursting out the door and how your heart sang and the joy of it? Weekends and holidays. So these, these times made that adult reality tolerable. So I thought about all of this, being free, being open to possibilities, what if all of that means? And a couple of childhood memories keep coming back to me and I think that's for me, it's helped me understand how I got to where I was and what's going on here. So there's a couple of really strange memories I have, and I want to share them with you. So when I was four, I had this memory, and it keeps coming up, and it's been coming up in my mind since I was little, and I was in a pine hideaway, just some pine trees behind our house, and I was scooping around the dirt and everything, and I was thinking something like, this is shaping my world. I'm shaping my world, I'm creating my world, my own tiny world. You know, and maybe we do this with dolls and with figurines and things like that. And somehow, somehow it made me feel like there was something magical about this that I needed to remember. But I never knew what. You know, I just had this idea, I'm supposed to remember something important. And even at four, I was log logical enough to go, what the heck am I supposed to remember? I'm four, right? <laughs> And then this other very strange thing, and I, I actually haven't, believe it or not, I've never asked anybody else this, so maybe you all can tell me. So this is the second, this is the second memory I have that keeps coming back to me. So when I was a kid, and my, I was about this age, four, and when my mom let me take a bath by myself, she'd run it or whatever, and then I'd sit in the bathtub in that warm water, and this really amazing buzzing sensation would come up over my body when I was in this warm water. And something about that reminded me of magic and reminded me of something I was supposed to remember. And it all kind of came to me, like, why am I thinking all those things? But, so I'll skip ahead in a moment right now. So for me, that's the truth bumps, right? The buzzing you get in your body. So I first felt it in a tub when I'm four, but I was trying to put it all together back then. So I would ask my mom, you know, some questions about all this, and I would ask her if magic was real, and I would tell her things like, I remember when I could fly. Right, Mom? We could at some point, right? And she said, girl, you're just dreaming. That's all magic. Those are pretend. They're not real. And one day when she was putting me to bed, I remember asking her something what I thought was very important to me. You know, I wanted to know, what happens when you die? And I'll never forget her answer to me. She said, oh, silly girl, don't you worry about that. You're not going to die. And I remember thinking, gosh, that's a great, strange answer. It's very evasive. Of course I'm going to die. You're going to die. We're all going to die. My cat died last week. Dying happens around here. Why are you not telling me what happens when we die? Oh, just don't think about that. But I didn't say a word. I just asked her to leave the light on in the hallway. I needed that light on in the hallway. This is those monsters that really were in the closet, right? And I only had my dreams to give me any kind of answers. So what an interesting existence for a kid. Um, outdoor play and recess games and alone time. And then combined with this world, where I would look at my, you know, my playmates, my, my friends, sitting in the desks, and, you know, with these invisible chains on them, almost. We really felt, you know, locked into this, this place. So I ended up a little bit like everybody else in a box. But I knew that box was there, and I started poking <laughs> a long time ago. 
And I think that's what my friend Jill meant. Just so you know, you've always been that way. I was asking the questions. So it's no wonder that this photograph that she posted to my Facebook page really made such an impression on me. It reached back 50 years to who I think I really am. And I think it neatly explains my childhood and my current world, you know, this transition team. And I think it explains why I'm here. But I also think it's why you are here. <laughs> I think we're all here on this transition team, and a lot of people want to know what's the big thing they're supposed to do. You know, are they supposed to open a wellness center? Well, some people are, but not all of us. You're just supposed to be on this team. We were truly closest to our superpowers when we were kids. We were less corrupted and less jaded. We were less programmed by belief systems, and I guarantee you it's the belief systems that cause you pain in your life and suffering. And if you can figure out which ones they are and alter them, you'll have a much happier life. So today, gathering with all of you here is like being on one big playground for me, and I'm so happy to be here. And Greg and Michelle, the organizers and hosts, you are all so amazing. And it's like a great big playground in 5D where we can all come together and share these amazing ideas. and. Um, make friends, and create the world that we want to live in. They do such a great service at N5D. And I'm happy to call all of you friends. So, I'm in such amazing company, and I'm so honored to be here. So who am I? Well, my own work on this transition team for humanity has to do with this lady, the late, great Dolores Cannon. She was my teacher and my mentor. And all of the work that I'm doing now is based upon her own work and continuation of her work. Dolores Cannon discovered she had superpowers. She had discovered that she and her clients had access to amazing knowledge, ancient history, could go to the places where they could do things like teleport and fly, time travel, shape shift, heal themselves, all of these things. Sometimes even communicate with source itself. In sessions and with her work, Dolores discovered all of us have access to these superpowers. And I was blessed to work with and alongside of her for many years. Very, very blessed. And the really fun thing to mention at this point is she died in October of 2014, but our relationship has not ended. It's simply shifted. And in some ways, I'm more close to this woman than ever because some of her <coughs> ego, and she was an amazing woman, but she had a big ego. It, it kept her alive and safe in this world. She was a grandma in Arkansas who talked about past lives. You know, she wrote three books about talking to Nostradamus. If you don't have an ego, you don't survive. You don't survive that kind of thing in the Bible Belt. <laughs> so discovering Dolores and her work in 2008 brought it all back to me, all of it. All of it, everything about discovering her, getting to her, getting to her class. I remember throwing my backpack in the truck. I'm headed to Arkansas to take her class. Oh my God, she's gonna pick me to be her demonstration subject. I knew it to the very inside of my bones. And when I got there and I watched almost everyone in her class, to be the demonstration subject because she was teaching her method, teaching others how to do what she was doing. Everybody wanted to be the demonstration subject. Half the class was there not to do the work theirself, themselves, but because the, her waiting list was so long. And you, if you paid for the class, you got a method, you know, a session, and there you have it. I knew it was going to be me. And I knew it was going to be me with all my heart, so much so that I didn't put my name on the list. And for a few minutes, I thought I was testing God. I truly did. I went, oh God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm gonna test you. You know, there's this little part of me. If you go, put your name on the list. How are you gonna get picked? And there's this other part of me that says, it's gonna be you. And this is time for you to trust in magic. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if there's 50 people in this class, and 49 of you put the name on the list. You are gonna be the one she picks. And my heart's beating like this as she's coming down the time when it's supposed to 
be that she tells him who she's going to do, <laughs> pick for the demonstration subject. And she walks right up to me and she says, she called me Candy. Candy, they've told me it's supposed to be you to be my demonstration <laughs> subject. <laughs> the whole class, and particularly the gal next to me, my roommate, went something like this. <laughs> because I did not stand in line and put my name on that list. And at that moment, as magical as it's been with Dolores, that moment, it was like, oh my God, yes. Magic is real. It is so real. And even getting there was magical. So, I've been practicing Dolores' method now for more than eight years. One of my first sessions was on this lady right here. <laughs> my really good friend, Linda. And it really is truly happening. We are shifting. We are evolving. We're changing. We're moving into this amazing new age of Pisces, the new Earth, the fifth dimension. And as you've already heard from everyone else, our powers are coming online. They really are. Our DNA changing, shifting, expanding, or waking up. But here's how it's happening. We all kind of maybe thought it might happen. Boom, it's happened. Well, it's happening kind of one person at a time, one event at a time. And I think we chose that, on this timeline anyway. We chose that. And we chose that because we're easier, it may be easier for us to accept. You know, if I suddenly said, oh, I want to teleport over to Linda's house and I was there, I might have a mental problem with it in the end if, if it's never happened before, right? So we're doing it bit by bit. <laughs> but there's no way it can be stopped. It's kind of like the first few drops of a rainstorm. You know when you're outside and just the first few drops come, and they're big, and they're fat, but there's a lot of space between them? I think that's where we are. At least it seems like that's where we are to me, because some of those drops can smack you right in the face, but most of them are just kind of out there. So this storm is coming, and there is no way it's going to be washed in uh, No way it's going to be avoided, and it's going to wash away a lot of crap. Yeah, it is. So I want to tell you about three of my magical and super powerful clients by telling you about um, their stories. So one story is of a man who with his superhuman, super healing, ab healing abilities rebuilt his crushed vertebrae. He had crushed vertebrae, several of them. One story is of a woman who accessed information about humanity's manifestation and bilocation potential, so we actually are talking about bilocation. And the last is a really powerful story about a man who came to the planet to learn to live through the heart. So this man who came because of his vertebrae, he actually came for the session in a very unenthusiastic manner. His wife had made the appointment for him. His wife made the appointment for him and her. And she decided it was good for them to both do this. And they both were, at the time, suffering from multiple myeloma. Do you all know what that is? It is a really awful blood and bone cancer. And they actually didn't both come down with it. They met each other at some point after both having it, met each other, and then were a couple. But she was the enthusiastic one. She was the researcher. She was the awake one, the one coming to things like this. She wanted to go do the session. And she made the appointment for both of them. And they had both bowed out of conventional treatment from doctors because the chemotherapy made them sick. Um, they decided to do nutrition. They got a little bit better, but they they didn't get all the way better. And they were searching for more complete answers and, um, and healing. So I'm always a bit concerned when somebody makes an appointment for somebody else. This is, you know, can be an issue. And I remember sitting down making it my very first business um, of mine to make sure if he really wanted to be there. And after some frank questioning, you know, he answered me very honestly. He was there on his own agreement. And when we were all done with that conversation, I remember having the word lukewarm in my head. And he was lukewarm about all of this. But he was first, and they were there, and they traveled up from Texas to have a session. And so, so we did. So we had a session. 
So his story in the main, how this all happened was, he was having a chiropractic adjustment when the doctor pushed down on his back and something absolutely horrific happened. The man expressed, you know, searing pain. And um, the chiropractor, as I was told in the story, went white as a sheep and sent him off to the emergency room. He <coughs> destroyed three or four of his vertebrae in his back. And that's how he found out he had, got, he had cancer. He had no idea he had cancer. He was just having some issues with his back. And that happened. And that's how he found out that he had multiple myeloma. So he had had the cancer for uh, you know quite a bit of time and just wasn't aware of it. So he and his, and his wife also went down the traditional route for a while but gave it up. And I should note that even though this cancer, of course, was a big deal in his life, he'd actually lived past the life expectancy of it. And his biggest problem was this back. I mean, it really, really hurt him. He was only able to stand or walk or sit about four hours a day. The rest of the time he was on painkillers and he was laying down. It directly affected him in some ways even more than the cancer. And he had this visible hump on his back. And it was about, you know, I don't know, kind of maybe like half a cantaloupe. And you could see it through his shirt. I mean, his, you know, his body had scar tissue all over it and he kind of walked like this. So, in our session, he had a textbook case of a past life. Easily went to past life. He experienced life as this wealthy landowner in the 18th century, probably England. He had a wife and two children. His life was comfortable and easy. It was peaceful. He was born into privilege. He, had to, he didn't worry about anything. He traveled a lot, and he loved traveling. He loved his family. He also loved leaving the kids and wife behind and traipsing around the rest of Europe with his, his buddies. I mean, he just loved it. And that's what his life was like. So we visit a day in his life, in the past life progression. And then we go to another day. So it comes to pass he's coming home from a trip. And he finds the house in disarray. And he finds only one person alive, one of the maids, is in the corner of the kitchen sick and crying her eyes out. A sickness had come, wiped out everybody. Everybody was dead. His wife, his children, the rest of the servants. And it had happened so fast, and there was no way, of course, in those days really to send a word. And, and they died. So why did the man's higher self show him this life? Well, it showed him how important family was to him, both then and even now in his current life. And his higher self explained that he was so devastated in that life by guilt that he had left the family and that they all died and nothing would happen to him and that they died without him. He carried that massive guilt into his current lifetime. And what he was doing then in his current lifetime was he was overcompensating. He felt so guilty, so sad, that he took care of everybody but himself. And he tucked away that guilt and sadness, and this I quote, all the way to the marrow of his bones. I don't know about you, but that makes my hair stand up, and I've said that line many times. You know, the sadness, the guilt, the anger at himself, tucked into the marrow of his bones, created the cancer. So he was caring for others at his own expense. He was putting himself last. And this was the root cause of his cancer. So then I asked the big question, can we heal the cancer? The higher self says, it's absolutely possible to be healed. He has to begin to love himself. Have you heard that before? He has to put his body first to survive. He has to make time for himself. He has to care for himself first. When he's healthy, then he can take care of others because then he'll have a place of strength and resources to take care of everyone else. Bet you all heard that before, right? Mm -hmm. So then I say, great, can we remove the cancer right here, right now? His higher self said, no. He hadn't done any of that yet. 
test it. No, we're not going to heal him of the cancer. It wasn't appropriate. He had to go home and make those changes. Higher self said if he makes those changes, the cancer will just vaporize and just simply disappear. There won't be no reason to have cancer. So I do the... <laughs> okay. So then I ask about his back. I say, you know, his back gives him so much pain, so much difficulty. He's limited himself to such a brief time where he can even do anything, and he spends most of that time taking care of other people. You know, what about if he was more comfortable? Maybe he'd be inspired to be healthier and take better care of himself and make changes in his life that you suggest. What do you think? Oh, my friend. The higher self said, oh, that pain and challenge? That's no longer necessary. It was simply an event to get him to find out about the cancer. The cancer was the real problem. He doesn't need the back injury anymore. So you can heal it right now? Yes, it's done. Okay. Sometimes in these sessions, crazy shit happens. I mean, <laughs> lights, orbs, buzzing, you know, things fall off the wall. This guy, nothing. No, I mean, nothing. And I'm like, okay. So when he woke up from trance, he said, though, you know, I asked him what he remembered, what he recalled, and he remembered the whole part about being the European. He was just like, gosh, did I, did I cry? Yes, you did, actually. He remembered that whole part. He remembered nothing about the higher self part. So I reminded him he would hear it on the recording, and I told him how he could heal his cancer and that his back was healed energetically already, but, you know, it might take time to manifest. And he was like, it was good now, and then he left. So four days later, I get a call from his wife. She said, if I didn't see it with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it. He doesn't have any pain, and that bump is halfway gone. Wow. She had very little change, and I can't tell you why. Sometimes these things are amazing, and sometimes, I don't know. But then I got another call from her two days after that. No bump. No bump on his back at all. And I remember asking, would you send me an x-ray sometime <laughs> before and after? But of course, they've left the traditional medical system, and I doubt that they will. And just because I can, I'm going to show you two scans. It's not the story, OK? This is not the story, but it's a scan that I have. And it's a gathering of people like this, so I have to show this. So this is a, a scan of a woman with bulging discs. You can find this story on my website. and I one of my radio shows. You see that one big bulge there going into the spine? That one right there? That's the spinal column that that bulge is pushing into. This gal too had incredible pain. Um, she had a QHHT session. This is the after. Two hours of hypnosis. These are the scans together. Not only the bulge, but look at the rest of the quality of the organs and of the bones. There was giant, giant cognitive dissonance <laughs> in her body. Literally, and I have a woman here, but it was a he. He told her to get out of his office. He didn't want to see her again. His reality, right? His reality, he couldn't take it. He couldn't take it. Okay, so a, a great story. But that's, um, yeah. That's another story for another day. So the next client um, had an amazingly difficult childhood. And most people who come to see me do actually have some crummy things go on in their life. But the extent of the mental and physical abuse this young woman experienced was, was just horrific. It was beyond terrible. It was a miracle she was even alive, let alone in my office, able to put words together into sentences. And it was amazing some of the things that I learned about her. She'd already done what she had believed was most of the forgiveness, and she really did, of what was going on. She came to see me to talk about manifestation and bilocation. I mean, real some of the real superhuman powers we're talking about, right? And she gets some really great information. So it happens that this gal in middle and high school 
had turned to sports and track specifically in part to escape her home life. She excelled in the distances and she broke records and, and she really wanted to know what was going on there because she felt even as a kid, there was something magical going on there. It was part of why she wanted a session. And we were not to, to be disappointed. She was taken to a life where she was actually a young boy in, in ancient times, also running. She wanted to know how it was that she was such a fast runner. So here's how she described it. And this is, quote, she says, this is she saying this entranced. Going beyond the heavy, dense body, I can go beyond it. I have to have my body, so I just make it come with me. I can go faster than it. So I say, how's that work? She says, I have to pull it with me. I've always known how to do that. See, what I do is I leave the third dimension in my mind, right? And when I feel the feelings of what it feels like to be out of the third dimension, that goes ahead of her body. She brings those sensations with her light body, herself. And so when you intend to run, you want to project yourself out in front of everyone else. But to win, but more than that, to run really, really fast, um, what you do is you run faster than you can go. And that's a mental thing. Desiring to project yourself forward is a higher tingly feeling. Back to the bathtub, right? Bodies are dense and slow and heavy. Every time you feel the truth bumps, you're starting to move into that next world. That's what that is. It's literally your DNA vibrating. Dolores told me that in a dream. So if you can put yourself in front of your body, it, you pull it with you as your physical partner. And she says, when you raise your vibration for any reason, including being in a place like this, we're helping not only all of us who are here, but truly the world. Absolutely. You create this magnetic pull into the higher vibration. She says, it's only hard for a moment, and the effort's mostly mental. And the secret to intending to go faster is to go faster than the body can go. So it's mostly that mental barrier. And we found out this is step one of bilocation. So her higher self told her that her intensely difficult childhood demanded the feeling of leaving her body just to be able to survive the abuse. So that's how the running came in, etc. And so I ask, in this world, in this timeline, really work, we're going to bilocate? Absolutely. Yes. Will others too? Yes. Easily. Okay. And then we ask about manifesting objects. Will that be real too? Will she really be able to manifest an apple? Absolutely. She should begin to gather with others, just like we're doing here, to talk about this. People who really believe who it's possible, believe these sorts of things are possible. Don't let the naysayers stop you, lovingly understand, but it's the combined energies of groups like this that create the place where we're gonna be able to do this. We're manifesting and creating situations very easily now, and objects are not far behind. Okay, so my last client, this guy. This man's entire life plan was to experience life on Earth with not one, not two, but three separate human hearts. He was an athlete, he still is, and at the tender age of 18, he suddenly and inexplicably, on the football field, experienced a heart event, an idiopathic heart failure. And for those of you who don't know the definition, I'm gonna read it precisely, it's relating to or denoting any disease or condition that arises spontaneously for which the cause is unknown. No reason for him to have heart failure. He was an athlete, he was in great shape, he had no family history. He was extremely healthy. So as he lay in the hospital bed waiting for a donor heart, his tender teenage years, he began to ask those very big questions that maybe some of you have asked too. Why is this happening to me? What's going on? Wouldn't we all ask those questions? 
And I'm going to take just a sideways moment to address something that I think is very important for all of us here to consider. So we here in the spiritual metaphysical community sometimes say, well, you create your own reality. Well, think about this guy. At 18, laying in a hospital for a donor bed, a donor heart, would, do you think that would in any way be helpful to say to him? And if you knew his background or his life, you couldn't even make sense of that anyway. He had a great family. What the heck, right? So, for no obvious reason, his heart shuts down. So what I say is, you know, there's a reason, but we can't always see or know why. So do we create our own reality? <coughs> Absolutely we do. But it's not always with our conscious mind and our conscious thoughts. Do our conscious minds and thoughts contribute to creating our reality? Absolutely. Absolutely. But a lot of reality creation comes from a different place, a place that our conscious minds can't go or can't go often, depending on, and then the list is long. So this is something I think we all need to be very aware of as healers and helping others, because sometimes that phrase can be ouchy. You can't always consciously come up with the ideas or the reasons why these things happen when you're currently experiencing a challenge. So anyway, this fellow ends up coming to see me many, many years later to find out exactly why all of this was going on. So back to the story. Remember, he's 18, and he's an athlete, and his heart quits, but he's otherwise in fabulous health, which sounds strange, right? He's laying in a bed, his heart's going. But everything else in it, he's, he's in fabulous health. So he's a prime candidate for a heart transplant. So he gets a heart transplant. And then it takes a very long time to get to the next part of the story, another year or so, to unravel what actually happened. But what happened was this. With the new healthy donor heart, when the surgeon put the heart in, he unknowingly and unfortunately nicked one of the arteries as it went in, <coughs> the brand new donor heart. It took a year to figure out why he wasn't feeling better. Because imagine, oh, it just takes a while, right? It took a long time to find out the second heart fails. So back he is, being put on the heart donor transplant list. He's barely 20. Wait for his third human heart. I mean, I tried not to, my, my job when he's telling me this story. So he didn't have to wait very long, and circumstances brought in his third heart. And he went through the transplant surgery on da, 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 Valentine's Day. Okay? So everything went well this go-round. Now, here's something that you might not know. I didn't know this until this man sat in my office. The traditional medical profession tells you that if you get a heart transplant, you get 10 more years of life. Heart transplants don't take you into way age. And many people don't get their heart transplants at 20. It's usually later. 10 years. The very best, 10 years. So I didn't know that. Um, so he had gotten the second transplant at 20. He was really only expected to live till 30. I mean, imagine. 30 sounds really, really young to me right now. <laughs> So he came to see me, he was well beyond 30, and asking all of these questions, right? What happened? What about those other souls? And he was still an athlete. And his doctors were like, well, you know, maybe you ought to take it easy there, Bella. He was like, I feel great. So he had all of these questions. He was an astonishingly good health, very much an athlete. He was vibrant, glowed health. And he had a spectacularly amazing QHHT session. It answered questions for him and explained so much. And it explained some deep understanding, not only for his own life, but for all of us, which is why I love this work so much. Very often, it explains just that person's life, the man with a broken vertebrae cancer. It was all about him. This went to a different level. This was, a, this was information and a session for all of us. 
So in the session, he discovered that his soul had created a contract, a life plan and pact with the other two people, their hearts. The plan was, a very unique plan, that in a single human body, he would, his personality would carry not one, not two, but three human hearts in a single lifetime. During this, the transition phase, where we're beginning to live through the heart. For the awakening of humanity, for the benefit of all of us. It was kind of, you know, it was like the test pilot for this, this thing, this idea. And here's some of the really fun stuff that came out of that session. He got to find out about the intimate lives of the donors. You don't get to know that in our society. I mean, that makes sense, privacy and all of that. He finds out their life stories. He even finds out why and how they died. And one of them, the man had taken his own life. And that heart went into him and explained his sudden bouts of sadness and grief and desperation. Right? So the expansion was for all of them, for all three of their hearts to live during this time. And he wept at the beauty of it all, the intricate connections, the meaningful details, this grand plan that affected individually, individuals, families, communities, healthcare, and ideas about human beings sharing organs, and the seat of the soul itself, the heart. And he learned that it was monumentally important for ascension itself. And his higher self solved the mystery that consumed his internal questioning about why this all happened to him. So, you know, think again about being 18. It was not appropriate, nor in any way possible for him to know what was going on at 18 while he's waiting for his first heart. Just imagine if he had a session or anything else that would answer his questions. Oh, well, if you're going to get a heart, that one's going to fail, too. I mean, think about that. Sometimes we're just not supposed to know, right? And perhaps one of the most practical and useful bits of information that he got about his physical health from his higher self was about the actual physical health of his heart, because he was playing sports, right? And his higher self assured him that he was treating his heart well. It was more than strong enough. It was going to go way past the 10 years. His doctors were already astonished, and they were just going to have to continue to look like this. <laughs> you don't know why everything's going so well. He was told his life was magical, and the definition of a heart-centered life and he actually goes around the country telling his story and encouraging others to be transplant donors in case something happens. Three physical hearts, each holding the soul essence, combining to experience one man's life, would exponentially expand his heart center and all the heart center of humanity. And how beautiful is that? His story so profoundly illustrates that phrase, living from the heart. I mean, he's like the poster boy, right, for us all. So it was at this part of writing my speech that I found myself unexpectedly adding kind of a P.S. Another heart story that had not one, but several doctors and cardiologists doing like that to me about my heart. And the ending of that story happened just a few days ago. And I'm not going to tell it all, but I'm going to tell part of it. So I had, my family had, my doctors had some real concerns about what was going on with my physical heart. It, it really is a long story, and I, I'm going to tell it someday, but I'm just going to tell you a small part of the story. So I had to have this heart test done on my my heart. So I'm laying on this uh, table and these images are being scanned of my own heart and I have to lay still for 20 minutes so I take it as a, you know, I'm just going to meditate, right? I'm going to meditate. Hey, I know what, I'm going to focus on my heart. I'm going to focus on my heart with a meditation of love and forgiveness. 
forgiveness and gratitude. I don't know what the test is going to say. So I think about stories in my life. I focus on my mom who is suffering from congestive heart failure. Am I taking on some of her stuff? I don't know. Maybe I'm trying not to. I spent time releasing, forgiving, having authentic gratitude for a certain situation last year that cost me a great deal of heartache. I focused on releasing that. I focused on thanking my physical body. Hey, good job. You brought us into the 50s. We're doing all right. And then the test was over. And so as I'm sort of leaving, the lab tech comes running up to me and she says, Something really strange happened. <laughs> Something I've never seen before. We've shut down the machine. <laughs> they went haywire. <laughs> None of the scans are readable. We don't know what happened. We do a dozen of these a day, she said. A dozen. I've worked here for years. I don't know what's wrong with that machine. I've never seen the machine act up like that. I'm sorry, you're going to have to do it again. Okay. Okay. You're just going to lay still for another 20 minutes. Okay. Maybe I didn't release enough. <laughs> I didn't have enough gratitude. I didn't forgive enough. I didn't, I don't know. Okay. It's for a reason. It's always for a reason. So we go back. We do it again. So I said, I sent my mom love. I told her it was okay to go. And she was ready. Linda loves my mom as much as I do. I told her I would love her as much as possible, but I could not take away her own heart pain. That was her own journey. Uh, I couldn't take it from her or for her. And those others who disappointed me and hurt me, I sent them even more love and gratitude. For truly, because they really did, they helped me create a better life. I'm standing here right now. I went through a big heartbreak. But I'm here right now doing all of this in part because of that big heartbreak. And I have a much brighter, love-filled life right now. And I sent very genuine gratitude. And I thank my body even more. And I thought about how that is creating my life and creating my world by doing this meditation. And that second set of pictures, I really thought, you know, I feel a little different. No matter what happens, I'm going to be okay. Because I believe in eternal life. It doesn't matter. It's, it's going to be okay no matter what. So I released everything that I could. I mentally hugged my body, and even out loud I said thank you to my body. And then the second 20 minutes were over. So I go back out into the waiting room, and I wait for the lab tech to tell me it's okay to go. So she took even longer, even longer. I could hear her behind the door. She's on the phone. She's on the phone. And she finally comes out. And she has this big, big smile on her face. And she says, you're free to go, Mrs. Crogwell. I'm like, OK. I mean, I kind of want to say, are you sure? Because her entire energy was saying, oh my god, no, it happened again. Oh my god, no, it happened again. But she's like, you're free to go. <laughs> and I'm reading her energy. And if anything about it was wonderful, it was like, I can read your energy completely. Or any doubt, I know what you're really saying. You're not saying those things, meaning everything's fine. And then she says, as I'm literally going out the door, I hope it turns out well for you. <laughs> I almost said, seriously? You could have kept that one to yourself. <laughs> so in the end, the doctors say I'm fine. I'm more than fine. They actually had a powwow, and they can't really explain what happened to me or why, but they decided this, that I have the healthiest heart they've ever seen, oh, ever. <laughs> and, and I literally said, are you kidding? And they said, yeah, it's all that 
well, all those workouts that you do. And I went, okay, I ride horses every once in a while. I do yoga in the gentle kind. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not running marathons. I quiz them, don't you have athletes? Well, yeah, and you've never said no, but it, you're fine. And then I did some other tests. So I think that they're going to find more people like me eventually. And they're going to find more people like you too. I think that um, whatever happened with those machines, <laughs> they're, going to, they're going to have more scans of those show up. And maybe it is really because of what's happening with our heart and what's possible. So we are on the transition team. Your heart, my heart, we are on the transition team and coming together like this, combining our energetic fields creates expansion, possibilities, and growth. And I congratulate each of you who are here. And I thank you for helping to expand my own heart center and field of consciousness. And so, I just want to tell you a little bit about what I do out there in the world. So, Dolores Cannon allowed me to create her original support form many years ago, and it still runs. Dolores Cannon, QHHT.com is where you can find out information about her, our support form, other practitioners who do the same kind of work that I do. And we're expanding that all the time. As a matter of fact, I'd like to tell you about just one project that we're doing. Dolores wrote 20 books. I have wanted, and I know you're going to love this, Greg and Michelle. <coughs> I wanted every one of those books to have an index in the back. DNA. Codons the 80s, all of that. They didn't do that. Um, Ozark Mountain didn't do that. Well, our group is doing that. We're doing that and we're making that information available to those who are in our support group and we're also making it available for a very just small research fee to, to anybody who's interested. Give you the ability to search through her 20 and plus books uh, to, to be able to find that. About half the books have been indexed, professionally indexed so far. So we're going to be a professional place to look for that information. And if you want to find out more about me, you can find me at newattorney.com. And you can turn into any of my radio, either of my radio shows, which, again, Greg and Michelle, I mean, you what can I say? You've expanded everything about my world, and I love you very much. I have coupons and information at my table back in the corner. Thank you.